Hi, I'm Dr. Odin. Hi, I'm Erica. I'm Kamal. Hi, Kamal. What are your majors? Uh, in bioengineering. Oh, that's uh, great. I'm, I'm thinking about physics, maybe chemical engineering. I don't know yet. Okay, well, good. Maybe this design class will help you decide. Yeah, I hope so. So we were able to read the prompt that was given to us. Um, and we just wanted to ask if you would mind restating the problem, just to make sure everything is clear. Sure. So um, I travel quite a bit to the developing world, and we go into really low resource clinics, and we ask doctors and nurses, what are the challenges that you have in delivering health care? And for the last two years, the number one challenge that has been brought to us, to our attention, is the risk that um, happens when babies, particularly the smallest babies, are put on IV fluids. Because when babies are dehydrated, it's critically important that they get rehydrated quickly. But if um, they use an IV bag, and normally in these settings, they don't have pumps um, to control the fluid flow. So what they'll do is they'll hang an IV bag and they'll put the IV into the child's arm, and then the doctor goes away and starts working on another patient. And usually the IV bags have one liter of fluid in it. And often these small babies might need 100 milliliters or 150 milliliters of fluid. And in fact, if they get twice that amount or more, they could actually have really serious consequences, um, as even all the way to death uh, if they get overhydrated. So um, we talked to doctors who have said to us that there have been times when their clinics have been so busy that uh, when they have a baby that needs rehydration, they're worried about actually giving them that therapy because they're worried that they won't be able to turn the IV flow off in time. Right. Um, so that's really the problem is to identify or find a solution to that problem. In other words, create a device that's extremely low cost, that doesn't require power or electricity, but will control the volume of fluid that's delivered to a baby. All right. Okay. okay. Have there been any other attempts to solve this problem before? There have. So we have a class, um, Global Health 360, that um, students work on design challenges. And we've offered this up actually a couple of times. And students have come up with some really interesting solutions, um, but they haven't worked. So one solution that I liked a whole lot, um, but it really just ended up not working, was they took a full IV bag and they created a system kind of like a chip clip where they would clip the bag part way up and that way you'd have sort of two compartments of fluid so you'd have um, a small amount of fluid underneath the clip and then the larger amount of fluid above the clip and then you would start the IV the idea was you would start the IV and just the fluid underneath the clip would go out and be mm -hmm. delivered to the baby. So I, I really like that solution. I think it was a very clever solution, but in practice what happened was they were never able to get the clip tight enough to completely stop the fluid flow. So the fluid would continue to flow kind of through the um, squeezed clip mm -hmm. out to the baby, so they could never get it to completely stop. Okay. Um, another solution that they've actually, doctors have told me they use in the field is just emptying the IV bag. So they literally like, take a one liter bag and empty out all the whole bag except for what they want um, left. But you think about the waste that's involved with that and when you were talking about a really low resource setting, you hate to have that much uh, waste. Okay, um, so you're saying um, they're not able to stop the fluid in time um, or the doctors aren't, or they're unable to, um, aren't there like parents around the child that are monitoring? Then, um, so I, I think um, particularly in this low resource setting where you're dealing with patients um, and their parents who might not be literate or understand, like have numeracy skills, relying on the parent to stop the flow at a certain time or, or after a certain volume um, really isn't very realistic. Okay. And um, you know, you might be able to have parents warn you if something a little more drastic happened, but um, probably they wouldn't even be able to tell, like in a full IV bag with one liter, when would it be that 150 milliliters had gone out or 50 milliliters mm -hmm. had gone out. Um, so they really haven't been able to rely on the parents. And for the clinicians, the issue really is volume of patients. So what's been described to me is like a cholera outbreak where it's critical to get the babies rehydrated and the doctors literally are putting IV after IV after IV after IV and they have every intention of getting back 
um, to the first baby, maybe after 15 minutes, mm -hmm. um, but it's easy to get to forget. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's when they've um, had problems. Is the client the same as the user? Um, no, so I, you should consider me as your client um, and perhaps sort of I will help channel some of the uh, doctors in Malawi um, to kind of get their opinion uh, for you, but I would be the client. The user of the device is going to be the nurse or the clinical officer or the doctor that's treating patients in Malawi. Um, who would be able to teach them how to use the device then? Um, I, I think what would normally happen when a new device goes into these hospitals is that one or two of the staff become experts and then they would train the rest of the staff. So probably in addition to having the device itself, in the long run there would also be training materials. Okay. Um, maybe there'd be a poster. It's very common on the walls there that they put up posters um, that are called job aids mm -hmm. where there's like a really visual description of how to use the technology. Mm -hmm. um, so in the long run it would be great to have something like that. Okay. Are there any other usability or ease of use uh, concerns that like we need to keep in mind? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, the user there uh, is has the potential of, for example, they might not they might have a hard time seeing. Um, mm -hmm. They may not have access to glasses as well. So you anything that you have that they would have to look at and see, you wouldn't want to put in a tiny font. Okay. You want to make it easy for them to use it correctly. Um, there are, there's a, a um, faculty member here at Rice that's an expert on user assessments. So when you get to that point, I think having a consultation with him where you could talk to him about what kind of testing would be appropriate to make sure um, that your device is easy to use. Um, would you be able to define some of the objectives or the constraints of the project? Sure. So the, the device has got to be very low cost, mm -hmm. um, low or no power requirement. So um, access to electricity is quite difficult in this environment. And it needs to be able to control the volume accurately. That's uh, IV fluid that's delivered to the patient. Okay. Um, so how, when, you, when you say low cost, is there a specific uh, uh, price that we should target? So in an ideal world, less than $20. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it might be able to go up to $50. And this is materials and labor and um, sort of the, the selling price? So I'm thinking the cost to manufacture, but probably not including labor. Okay. So okay. just the like, bill of materials, which would be just the um, things that go into making the device. Um, how long would this device need to last for? Like what's the durability? I think if it cost at the upper end of what I said was reasonable, $50, I think it's important that it lasts probably about five years. Okay. So would they be using it like in between patients then? So they would use, I would envision probably that it's a device that would be used for one patient mm -hmm. at a time, but then between patients they could move it to a different patient. So the same device would be used over and over again yeah. for multiple patients. So they'd have to be able to clean the device between each patient? They would need to be able to clean the device between each patient. I also think when you think about um, sort of it being sterile, it's important mm -hmm. to not have your device actually touch the fluid that's delivered. Um, because if it were touching the fluid that was delivered, you'd have a much harder time using it between patients. Okay. And is there only one fluid we should uh, target or a lot of different fluids? So IV fluids are, are um, there are a variety of IV fluids that are delivered to patients. Often it's saline um, or a dextrose solution. It'll give a little bit of um, nutrition to mm -hmm. the, the baby. So um, it would be those two. Sometimes um, I, they also will take an IV bag that's full of saline and add a medicine to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's there is the potential that there be different densities of fluids, but primarily it would be kind of water. Okay. Um, okay. And maybe slight variations. Your device, though, should be able to deal with any kind of fluid that would be delivered. Okay. I guess the most viscous fluid that would be delivered um, might be blood, mm -hmm. um, but I would really focus on saline and water-based um, fluids. Do they have to deliver different amounts to to different patients? 
Yes. So often, um, if a baby is dehydrated, they will have a dose of fluid to give them that varies based on the child's weight. Okay. Um, so you, the doctor will definitely want to be able to control um, how much is delivered over quite a wide range. The amount that has been mentioned to me very often is like 150 milliliters or 200 milliliters, but it's possible that they might want to deliver 50 or 300 or 400 uh, over a period of time. Okay, so the device will have to stop a fluid like automatically, so maybe they'd have to like set it up. Will they be able to set it up, have time to set it up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they already are setting up an IV, and so they're there at the bedside. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding of what they do is they put up the IV um, bag, they connect it to the baby, and then they start the flow. And most IV bags, I don't know if you've ever seen an IV bag in a giving set, but there's a tube that goes down um, to the IV port that goes mm -hmm. into the, to the person's arm, and there's a roller clamp. And so the way they control how fast the flow goes is they adjust that roller clamp. Um, so what they'll do then is adjust the roller clamp and count drips. And based on the size of the tubing, the number of, the number of drips per time will tell them how fast it's gonna go. So mm -hmm. they sit there for a few minutes, you know, messing with it and making sure that it's a reasonable flow rate, but then they walk away. So is that something else we should look into? Uh, controlling the flow rate or like how fast the fluid's coming? So I think that, um, of course, it would be lovely to have a device that would control the volume and control the flow rate, but um, in some ways that exists. It's a much more expensive pump, and mm -hmm. um, the critical feature for this project really is volume control. If you could come up with a design that controlled flow rate as well, that would be fabulous, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not necessary. I also had a senior design team a couple of years ago do a device that was a flow rate controller controlling system which counted drips mm -hmm. um, in a drip chamber so it was like an optical device i can get you the information about both those previous projects just so you can look at those that would be lovely um, so it was a neat idea um but i i think it required power it had you know a photo detector and, and, and a light and you know kind of much more complicated mm -hmm. uh, system okay um are there any other so you said pumps are what are currently used. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other features of pumps that you think? We yeah, should so pumps use? are currently used in the U.S. or in developed clinics. I've never seen a fluid IV pump in um, a place like Malawi or Lesotho or Botswana. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen some syringe pumps where instead of a whole IV bag, they actually have a syringe that um, okay. that there's a system that will control the syringe. But a syringe, the biggest syringes, I think, are 60 milliliters, maybe 100 milliliters. And so um, that those pumps um, aren't really useful for this particular application because you really want to be able to give fluid out of an IV bag. Okay. So it wouldn't need to have, like, any kind of, like, alarm system, you don't think? Um, so commercial products now do have an alarm system. I would guess that the doctors in the field, it's probably a question you might want to ask them. Okay. Um, they might want an alarm, um, but I think you'd have to think about what is it going to alarm for. And that might be a feature. It's like, in my opinion, I think that may be a feature that would be a little too much for something that has no power requirement. I would be more worried about accurately being able to control the volume. And if you can do that quite accurately, um, then maybe you wouldn't need as much of an alarm system. Okay. But I, I do think that's something you should ask the cl clinicians that would be working with the device. Are there any other features that uh, you'd like to see in, a, in, in this device? Um, I would like the user to be able to control to within some known range how much fluid. So mm -hmm. it, it isn't that, I mean, I've been talking about like 150 milliliters of fluid. It's not that every baby would need 150 milliliters. So I think it needs to be easy for the user to vary what the um, total volume that's delivered is. Uh, what I don't know is how fine a gradation you need. You know, do you need okay. to be able to do it within 10 milliliters or within 100 milliliters? I, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be something also to ask some we all, doctors from the field, nurses from the field. We also have um, some colleagues across the street at Texas Children's that have spent a lot of time delivering healthcare 
um, in low resource settings. And so they also might be able to provide you feedback and that might be a little easier because okay. um, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to communicate with people in do Africa. You, do you think you'd be able to give us your contact information shortly? So what I would do is if you would send an email to me with mm -hmm. your questions, then mm -hmm. I'll forward it to a variety of contacts. Okay. Um, and then that way we can get you the feedback. You mentioned accuracy, but how accurate does the device need to be? I would think within 10% of the volume that you determine or that's set by the user would be a really good target. Okay. And how finely do they have to control like the changes in volumes? Um, so this is one where I think talking to users in the field would be a good idea, but I think about between 25 and 50 milliliters, so have be able to set it in increments. Okay. of 25 or 50 milliliters. I think 50 is probably reasonable, um, but I would want to ask my colleagues in Malawi to confirm that. Okay. So like the device itself would have to be like adjustable between tw like 25 or 50 milliliters, um, but then like the overall accuracy or like the amount of, for the volume that's dispensed between like 10%. So I, I want to make sure there are a couple of different things going on here. So mm -hmm. um, accuracy within 10%, that's okay. correct. But you'd want to be able to adjust the overall volume that's delivered to the baby mm -hmm. anywhere from, I would say, 50 to 500 or 600 milliliters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but when it's um, in 50 milliliter increments, so 50, okay. 100, 150, 200, does that make sense? Yeah, so you have like the accuracy, the volume range, and then the increments that it can be set at. Right. Okay. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the bags or the tubing and the fluids that they're using? Sure. So, um, have you ever seen an IV bag? Uh, kind of. So, um, you know, Rice EMS often has expired IV bags, so you could mm -hmm. um, contact them. You probably have some friends or maybe some upperclassmen at your college that, um, that are in the EMS group. Uh, so you might be able to get a few. That, that's a great way of mm -hmm. getting some IV bags. So it's a bag, usually um, about kind of that wide and that long. And uh, it comes pre-prepared as appropriate saline or dextrose solution if, if um, that's what the child needs. And then there are giving sets, which are the tubing. And so when they're mm -hmm. gonna, and, and those are stored in sterile packs. So they'll open up um, the tubing and connect it to the IV bag. And that's all done in a sterile way so that no bacteria are introduced. And um, then at the other end, they put a uh, kind of a um, catheter into mm -hmm. the okay. um, patient's vein. Uh, the IV bag itself is usually made out of a very flexible material, like a pouch, like a plastic pouch. There are, I've seen IVs, um, particularly in Botswana and Swaziland, that are actually bottles, glass bottles. Okay. Um, so in an ideal world, mm -hmm. your device would be able to work with any IV bag. The IV bags are made by multiple different manufacturers, and the hospital will get a certain kind of IV bag for a while, but then if the country's central medical stores orders a different kind, right, they get a, you know, a cheaper one from somewhere else, they're mm -hmm. going to have that one. So okay. it'd be good if your device didn't require a certain brand of IV bag. There are also... Um, You'll probably come across this really tiny IV bags, either half liter or a quarter liter IV bags um, that exist, but I've never seen those in um, in Southern Africa. Um, so they're much more expensive, and so they're they're just not that available. But you might, in your research, find out about them, and you might think, mm -hmm. oh, why don't you just use a smaller bag? Um, but I think it would be difficult. Okay. Do you think it should maybe? Um, function in the same way as in, as infusion pumps or like other devices, so it'd be quicker for them to learn. Um, that's always ideal to not like tip the norm. Mm -hmm. um, but infusion pumps, I've never seen one in the environment where this device would go into, so I don't know what the level of experience they would have for that. So, if if you're ranking in things of levels of importance, I'm not sure that having it work in the same way as the existing technology is actually going to be um, as important as it might be if you were designing a medical device for here in okay. the U.S. Um, and so, we're wondering what, how portable would it also have to be? 
Um, I would think that it would need to be able to go from bedside to bedside, um, a little bit like pumps are here at Texas Children's. It might be a great okay. idea if you guys could see a pump or maybe even go get, take a tour at Texas Children's to see. Mm -hmm. um, but IV pumps are placed on IV poles and transported around like that. Mm -hmm. IV poles are actually not that plentiful um, in Malawi or in, in some of the low resource settings I've been to in Africa. Um, so maybe something that's wall mounted, or maybe something that could be wall mounted, or could be on a pole, um, okay. would be uh, important because it needs to go. F they don't move the child to the. They wouldn't move a child's bed to a place where they would have this device. I think the device would have to be able to move to the child. Okay, uh, would we have to include? Um, like a way for it to be transported, maybe like a table that it comes with that it could rest so, on? So I think in the long run, probably yes. Um, I'm not sure for the purposes of this class that that should be one of your top priorities. Okay. Your absolute top priority mm -hmm. is to control volume accurately. Okay. Uh, well, these are all the questions we have for right now, but if we have any more, um, how should we get in touch with you? So the best way is to email me. You have my email address because uh, yeah. you sent me the list of questions uh, before. But email me, um, and I will try to answer you as quickly as possible. My office mm -hmm. is also here in the design kitchen. So um, feel free to knock on my door if I happen to be there. Uh, I won't always be able to meet with you, but we can try. OK. And how frequently would you like us to update you on our progress and uh, stay in touch with you? Um, I think ideal for me would be every two weeks and you know maybe what you could do is at the beginning of a week uh, every other week just email me and see if I could come by your table during class time um, on a Tuesday or a Thursday morning. If you have questions though between the two week mark don't hesitate to send me an email because I don't want you to wait two weeks just because you forgot to ask me at our last meeting. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank You're you. welcome. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks.